I'm Dr. Molly Marty, and welcome to Resiliency Matters. This is where we take the big resiliency research and best practices and break it down into small bite-sized pieces that you can begin using immediately to strengthen yourself and others. What if you could learn from a man who has spent more than 25 years volunteering in post-traumatic response across our nation and around the globe? Would you spend the next 28 minutes with us? What if in the next 10 minutes, you could learn specific tips to help others in your life move through trauma in their life? Would you hang out with us? Who is us? My other half today is Peter Tehan. Peter is an author. He is a diplomate for the National Center for Crisis Management, and he is a longstanding volunteer with the American Red Cross. Welcome, Peter. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I always find it's helpful to start uh, with some definitions or get on the same page. So mm -hmm. let's start with your working definition of trauma. When we're talking about trauma, I look at both individual and collective trauma. Individual trauma is an incident that impacts an individual with so much brutal force and intensity that it just, their psyche is just collapses and they have the inability to have any defenses and able to respond effectively to the incident. Collective trauma is that that happens to the community that strikes at the social fiber of the community and, and breaks it down and, and perform, oftentimes creates chaos within the community because their normal social fabric and structure becomes non-existent. Okay, so I think people are used to thinking more in individual trauma. You're, you're saying it creates a new normal. You're not mm -hmm. the same person on the backside that you were before. Collective trauma, that's really an interesting right. concept. Can you give us a, um, an example of collective trauma? Oftentimes after a disaster, neighborhoods are destroyed, churches, bars, restaurants, places where people socialize and gather are, are gone, and people do not have a place to gather and to communicate and to share memories. Uh, things like rotary clubs and sewing circles and, and just the, the coffee in the morning for people to gather. They have no place to gather, so they're separate. They're isolated from their friends and their community. Uh, the things that create the normalcy of their everyday routine. Another example would be a community that maybe was, uh, uh, had strong unity before a disaster can often, oftentimes be fractionalized afterwards because Oftentimes you'll see the people who have the, the haves and the have-nots, where people were not affected by disaster while others were. The recovery appears to be going more towards one group of people while other people, group of people are waiting for financial assistance or help to come their way. Okay, and in a nutshell, what is the impact of collective trauma? Does it interact with individual trauma? Collective trauma is, is, found, is the foundation for recovery because individual trauma usually is not successful unless the community that is providing support becomes whole. So as when we respond, we're looking, how do we build the community stronger and faster to help the individual recovery from the traumatic, you know, the individual recover from the traumatic ex experience. So you have been on the front scenes, I say in the trenches of a lot of post-crisis uh, situations around the mm -hmm. world over the past couple of decades. What are some of the key points that you see or the factors that emerge? I, well, I think the most, some of the most important factors is that the most basic human need is the need to feel safe. So when we go into a situation, we're always trying to figure out what do people need to feel safe? How do we control the situation to create that environment? Mm -hmm. The second is some of the, the strongest emotional reactions to a disaster is the fact that uh, people are, can't cope with living in the aftermath of the disaster. They maybe not have a house, they, they can't communicate, they don't have a routine to go into. That a, a grief and uh, loss is a normal reaction to a traumatic experience. Sometimes people think they're going crazy and we're constantly reassuring. No, the feelings you have are a normal reaction to an abnormal event. Uh, the other thing that is so important is that we, we prioritize who's the most important in a disaster response. And what I tell planners and responders is it has to be the victims and the families and the workers and the families. Those are the most essential key to a successful response is keeping them at number one priority. 
So there's so many gems, and you and I, in, in having a conversation about this, I thought you're, you're identifying factors, but there's also a lot of tips if we mm -hmm. uh, just twist this a little bit. So I think we have a slide to put up on the screen. One thing that you said that really stood out to me is that normalization of the grief. I know when we go into post-crisis communities, we being the Community Resilience Institute, we equip people to look at the anger, look at the um, some behaviors that they might take personal and say, oh, that's grief, mm -hmm. and, and that's grief, oh, and that's that's grief. Um, so it's really important to educate people about what that natural grieving process looks like. We're going to talk more about that in our time together here. Um, Destigmatizing mental health mm -hmm. is an important part of our work and um, really allowing people to get resources when needed. Um, is there anything else you want to say along these lines of tips to, to help others through trauma? Looking at the holistic approach is so critical because you have to look at the whole person, the, the physical, the emotional, the, the environment that they're living in and creating support systems that reinforce that to get them back to a normalcy, uh, the new norm to help them define what their future is going to look like. That way they can start setting goals and, and setting a path towards recovery. Okay. And I see in the tips that um, you talk about the mental, physical, and spiritual needs. Mm -hmm. And again, I think the mental, physical, more common sense or people think in those terms. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of the impact of a, um, a spiritual impact of a disaster? When I speak of spirituality of disaster response or the spiritual portion, I'm always key to make sure I'm not talking about whether a person believes in God or not believe in God. So a spirituality of disaster response reflects to an experience that is so powerful, so impactful, that it reaches down and changes the most inner core of your experience. For instance, in my latest response to Haiti filing the earthquake, I was a consultant for a, uh, with a medical team. We went in, we were assigned to the biggest hospital in, in Port-au-Prince. We had uh, a lot of structural damage. They were doing surgery without uh, anest little anesthesia, little pain care, uh, pain medicine afterwards. One night I was tasked along with an LPN and a dentist to run a 50-bed critical care unit. We had newborn twins to 90-some-year-old patients from multiple amputations, massive infections, and head wounds. Uh, nothing I was ever prepared for, and nothing, neither was the dentist. And working in that environment at night, we had no electricity, no air conditioning, no medical supplies. We had people crying out in pain and anguish for their mothers or their family members, and we couldn't respond. We had patient, 24 patients in IVs, and when we went to supply, we had to pull off, we only had six bottles, that, so we had to start pulling patients off of their life support drug. And it got to the point where the perspiration, the sweat was just drowning uh, my, uh, myself and the dentist, and I, I abandoned my patients, literally. I walked out and I said, I can't take this anymore. The, it was beyond horror that I had ever experienced before. The dentist quickly followed behind me, and we sat out in the front porch for over a half hour and say, nobody prepared us for this. We don't do patient care. Uh, I can't go back in. I, I can't breathe in there. There was no oxygen in that room. And we sat there in quiet for about a half hour, and we looked at each other and said, if not us, then, then who? And I remember that both of us stood up with this determined look on our face, and we ripped the sleeves off our shirt and we went back into this dark room and we took care of our patients. And we, we, we gave them care, we gave them comfort. Uh, all of a sudden the room felt cool. Uh, we knew what we had to do to take care of them. We didn't lose a patient that night. In fact, we were credited for saving a couple. We, that was a life-changing experience because it, it defined who we were as individuals and the, the contrast would be had we not gone back in, what would have been the experience uh, of a lifetime change? So a spiritual experience, a deep experience, a life-changing experience, um, that's part of experiencing and building resilience. That was a lot to take in on our first um, segment. So here's your tool number one. Individuals heal best from trauma within a strong, supportive environment. Resilience requires whole person and whole community supports. Moving beyond crisis, key factors when we come back. Hi, I'm Dr. 
Dr. Molly Marty, and welcome back to Resiliency Matters. We are speaking with Peter Tehan today, an author, a longstanding volunteer in, in international and, and national uh, crisis recovery. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to ask straight on top of this segment, because we have a lot of parents, a lot of teachers, a lot of youth builders who tune in, we often hear kids are resilient. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? I do, but kids will take their lead from adults in a disaster situation. When I do a lecture, I oftentimes ask groups, who's more resilient, who's able to respond more effectively to a disaster, the youth or the elderly? And majority of the people oftentimes say the youth. And studies have shown it's the elderly. And the reason for that is they have life experiences and coping skills that they developed over time that they're able to put things into perspective. Children and kids don't have that reference point to go with. So kids can be resilient, but they will take their lead from adults, and that's why it's important adults prepare for disaster, we take care of their self-care to be more resilient so that they can be the model for the children to lead them down the right path. It is so well said. I want to make sure they hear it. Adults, you're modeling for your kids. They are watching you, and um, kids need help. They, mm -hmm. Their brains aren't even developed to handle these things. So what an um, informative answer. So part of crisis recovery is understanding mm -hmm. loss. And oftentimes we think in physical terms, the house is gone, the flood, the tornado has taken it. What other types of loss do you see in the field that go well beyond physical? Sometimes the loss of possession becomes the least amount of loss. You know, it is the loss of control, the loss of environment, where they're going to live or what they're going to do, trusting the mother nature or how it's going to affect their lives. It is a, the, the loss of their faith. Sometimes, many times people have crisis in their faith. They just don't know how they're going to respond. Uh, just the family connections of, of what does it mean to, when you lose your, your, your structures, your, your community involvement. Uh, you know, I had one person tell me one time they, they, the biggest loss they had was their rose garden. And you said Rose Garden, that, you know, that doesn't seem like it'd be high on the list. But for them, it was roses that their great-great-grandfather had started and had bred over and passed down generation to generation. He was entrusted with this rose plant by previous, his previous family generations, and he lost it. He felt he had be abandoned, betrayed his entire family. And again, such a beautiful way to put a light on going beyond the physical to the mental to the spiritual. Mm -hmm. These are all those aspects. Um, there is research that talks about the phases of grief recovery. Mm -hmm. And I know that you use a model. Um, what are the four stages in the model that in the American Red Cross, I believe, uses this model? Well, a lot of professional organizations use the model and, and we use it to put things in perspective. We look at it, the heroic phase, the honeymoon phase the reconstruction, the disillusionment phase and the, and the uh, reconstruction phase. And it takes time from the immediate onset to years later. Okay, and we kind of put a cheat sheet, a tip sheet up on the screen here for our viewers so they can um, be thinking through this process. But what would you like to share about those four phases of recovery? Honeymoon phase is probably the one of the most deceptive. It's when every, the, everyone comes together and they believe that everything's going to be fine, that the recovery's going to go quickly. And so often their hopes get so built up so high that when reality sets in and the disillusionment phase sets in, it sets them into a real downturn spiral. Uh, so we try to be, make people understand that this is a process that goes through and it's going to take time before they get to the recovery piece. And I know on an individual basis, uh, several of our viewers are probably familiar with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of mm -hmm. grief. Um, we hear those thrown around a lot. Is, are there similarities between that model and, and the model that we just looked at? There is, and the similarity is it's not a, you go from one, two, three, mm -hmm. and four. You'll revisit. You may go back to disillusionment, back to honeymoon, and back to the reconstruction. And the fact that while you're going through it, your, your other family member, your next door neighbor or a responder or someone else in the community is going through it at a different time. So it may seem like total chaos because it's everybody around you is going through it at a different pace 
and it makes it seem like everyone's going crazy and that accentuates the stress and the response. Okay, so what I'm hearing about this stage is one, they're not linear. No. Two, that we all have an individual path. And mm -hmm. three, I think this is an important point, it goes beyond the victim. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Who else is being impacted? by that trauma? A lot of times people see the trauma as, as the victim, but quite honestly, we also have to look at the other side of the equation, the responder and the responders' families. Uh, the responders are more than just the police and the firefighter emergency services. It is the utility workers, it is the, the humanitarian aid workers, it is the people, if, you're, if they have staff staying at hotels, the hotel staff. Uh, we had a situation in a disaster one time where we had 56 motor coaches transporting families. We had to focus on the bus drivers because they were experiencing the disaster through the, the experiences that they were sharing with the families. So when we're building a plan, we have to look at the entire community and not narrow our focus down and say we can only take this little piece here. It has to be a complete plan because you have to work on the community collective trauma. And as you uh, shared in your experience with Haiti, it, it includes you, it includes mm -hmm. me, it includes yes. people that are out on the front lines doing this uh, recovery work as well. The caregiver is the, critical because we are so driven at taking care of others that we fail to take care of ourselves. And part of management is we have to make sure that the caregiver is taken care of. Mm -hmm. All right, so there is a wrap on our second segment with a tool for you to take with you. Understanding what to expect during the stages of recovering from trauma can speed up the healing process. From school shootings to global terrorism, it seems that it's nonstop, the breaking news that is coming at us and it is affecting us. Tips to dealing with that, stay tuned. I'm Dr. Molly Marty and welcome back to Resiliency Matters. We're speaking with Peter Tian today, an author and a um, post-crisis responder. And um, a, a couple studies came out, I just printed them out uh, as I was heading here, they're hot off the press. But the first one is uh, actually not a study, but a, a very a pivotal article, I think, in the Huffington Post about the impact of the breaking news cycle mm -hmm. on our health. And the author, um, who's the national president of the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, Michelle Neelan Woods, says, as research is documented, stress can cause unhealthy eating habits, increase the use of alcohol or tobacco products, wreak havoc on the immune system, mm -hmm. inhibit sleep, increase blood pressure, cause stomach problems, chest pains, or headaches. In other words, it can make us feel lousy. Mm -hmm. Although we cannot have a direct impact on these world events, if we put our minds to it, we can control our reactions. Mm -hmm. Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor and legendary psychiatrist, believed that attitude outweighs actual experience when it comes to coping with adverse or traumatic events. The better developed our coping skills, the more likely we are to handle our thoughts and behaviors in a way that strengthen our resilience and speed our healing. Mm -hmm. What tips do you have on uh, this just influx of sensationalism and uh, terroristic-based news? I, I think we can go back to the question with the children is serving as a model and, and part of it is you know we have to be a model to others the learning to turn the TV off learning to put the new the uh, internet down and, and not read the stories about it uh, and not spread with the gossip and get involved in the gossip learn the facts know how to take care of yourselves know how to take care of your family and with limited exposure to accurate information with 24-hour news, we get turned and we hear the story over and over and over again. We don't know whether it happened today or whether it's the same story five days ago. You know, we talked about disaster response. I have come home from in the middle of a hurricane or in the worst World Trade Center response, and I've gone back and watched old, old news story, and I look at there in doubt and say, is that the same event I was at? Because the intensity of the news builds it up so much greater than what actuality is. So turning it down, you know, taking it in a limited time, not allowing your kids to be exposed to adult conversations about the horrors that's there or the terrorism, so we impact fear into them. Right. 
And you mentioned terrorism, and I, I think that there are some unique triggers or dynamics with mm -hmm. terrorism. Would you agree? And, and what does that look like? There is unique factors with that. And, and the, th the key thing with terrorism, especially bioterrorism, is, is that it, it goes to the most, you know, the most dreaded thing that we as humans have, and that's the dread of the unknown. We are terrified of the unknown, and bioterrorism is a perfect example. Usually, it's a vi you know a, a, an element that's being an agent that's being transferred to other people. We don't know how it's being transferred. We don't know how we're going to catch it. Oftentimes, we don't know how it spreads, and the government sometimes doesn't give us accurate ways of, of managing or protecting ourselves. So we become terrified of our surroundings, and we end up then isolating ourselves from not only family and friends, but our community at large because stay away from me, I don't know whether you have it. And it can drive us into a desperate situation where we can feel isolated, we can feel depressed, we can helpless, and we can feel an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. And it's, you know, that goes back to learn, prepare, know what the truth is about the fact, and make intelligent decisions on how to take care of yourself and your family. And, and listen, but don't absorb everything that's out there because there's so much fallacy. We know that in a bioterrorist act that the psychological casualties will outnumber the actual physical casualties. And it's just people who are so frightened that they, they work themselves into an emotional frenzy. So we need to be very uh, increasingly aware of the stories we're telling ourselves, mm -hmm. the perspectives we're using, and to be mm -hmm. reframing those. Yes. Um, this is really all where resiliency building comes in, what we're talking about, mm -hmm. because these are skills that you can grow. Um, you've created resilience building programs for our military, for humanitarian organizations, for communities. What uh, has been the biggest challenge as you have created and, and gone to deliver the resilience program? I'd say the, the initial biggest challenge is to get people to believe that there's a need. Every time we go out to a program and say, well, we don't need that, oh, we, you know, it's not going to be a big issue. And you, you have to go in with a well thought out plan, figure out, develop a need, show them how it's going to be effective. And we do this even with industries, of showing what are your corporate, you know, how is this going to act, impact your bottom dollar if your people are, are not resilient to these crises. Uh, but once we tend to let, get them to educate them, pre-incident education, and then we develop a plan for them. And once we implement it, some of the strongest naysayers become our most vocal and strongest supporters saying, I never believed what it can do to make a benefit my family and my community, my school and my staff. So um, in talking about uh, resilience, I mentioned I grabbed a, another thing hot off the press, and that is year two on Post Sandy. Mm -hmm. And uh, in an earlier show, we had talked about uh, a study on year one, but they start out by saying neighbor helping neighbor, trust in a community, mm -hmm. looking out for each other. An Associated Press NORC Center for Public Affairs Research Survey, survey suggests that those factors collectively termed social resilience mm -hmm. have a big impact on how prepared communities feel for disasters such as Superstorm Sandy and are seen as more valuable in a crisis than even government. We're talking about connections mm -hmm. and caring and neighbor knowing neighbor and helping neighbor. Um, so what do you have to say about that and what would you say honing in on the individual resources of viewers watching and saying, but what can I do right now? Yeah, you know, once you've been in a disaster, it's it become very apparent that the first responders, the first emergency responder is your family member, your next door neighbor in the community. And as we talked about collective trauma and the, it's destroying the, the social impact of the community, they, the people who've been there know what it's like to lose that social fabric and that connection. So you, you have to work as a community, as a group, to rebuild that and make sure it's strong for the time you need it. You work, first of all, you gotta take care of yourself. You have to build a plan for what you're doing for yourself and your well-being, your family at the time of disaster. As much as we talk about it, studies show that only 24% of Americans have a disaster plan. You know, once you build your plan, then you go out and work with your community. Talk to your schools, your workplace, your you know, churches, and say, what are we doing to take care of ourselves? And get your government officials involved. But it's a bottom-up response that is the strongest response in resiliency building. And yet another thing you say that bears repeating that's 
one out of four has a plan. That means almost 75% of people are unprepared. Um, there are so many resources here, or two of them, that I want to highlight. I'm putting these up on the screen for you as well. One is Peter's book, and one is a book by one of his co-authors. Um, but these are chock full of uh, tips and tools and resources that you can take advantage as an individual. So you have those, including uh, Peter's book, Mass Fatalities. And our final tip we're going to leave you with, you can increase resilience by building a disaster plan, minimizing your general stress level, and enhancing your personal coping skills. Resources are available. Use them. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have found this to be an important resource. This is Dr. Molly Marty and Peter Tehan on Mediacom MC22, your local programming leader.